Welcome to That Anita Live. As you can tell, I have an in-studio audience and my guest today is Rashad Mills, here to discuss with us how men do self-care. Welcome, Rashad. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Licensed counselor. Yes. With his own story to tell. Yes. Your life kind of pinged pong before you evened out. I think that's a great way to describe it. It was a lot of, <laughs> that's a great way to describe it. A lot of back and forth uh -huh. until I was able to, um, for that term, to like even out and mellow things out. But it was a lot of ups and downs along the way. So what was, what was the first, I guess, incident where you kind of bounced down and asked yourself, hey, what is going on here? I think that would be 1997. At okay. the time, I was like literally trying to find myself. I graduated from high school in 1995 in a school in Baltimore, Maryland. I was really trying to discover who Rashad was, so mm -hmm. I like to say it in a humorous way, but it's not the humor, humorous about it. I was a street pharmacist, right? And that's an <laughs> AKA, like a drug dealer, so. And I wasn't very good at it at all. And I knew at some point that something was going to happen to get me back closer to who I originally was. Okay. I just wasn't good at it, and all the money I made, I would run to the local mall and buy tennis shoes and things of that nature. Oh. And I said to myself, I'm literally putting my freedom and my life on the line, and what's the return on the investment? Okay. A pair of Nikes. So June of 1997, I was out, you know, doing what I do at, at night, you know, selling drugs, and two gentlemen had approached me. And make a long story short, somebody had shot me. And the thing that was just so interesting about it, and I know I can say it now and, and literally laugh about it, mm -hmm. that I wasn't a good drug dealer because I had my gun in my hand and I froze. So when I go out and speak to a lot of the people in jails and prisons and they'll say, man, you had a gun in your hand and you froze? Mm -hmm. And they say, you weren't a real gangster. And I say, absolutely. <laughs> and I think for that split second in time, I think God used that as the greatest second of my life because okay. if I had pulled the trigger, I think the course of my life thereafter would have been greatly altered. So I think getting shot was like that first moment moment and it was like God was saying Rashad this isn't you I need you to change some things around in your life so that was the first moment like um, right now I have to walk around with a mm -hmm. steel metal rod in my leg mm -hmm. and you know stitched I literally had the bullet removed last year bullet fragments removed last year so uh, with this hideous scar but it's always a reminder of Rashad don't put yourself in environments that's not cut out for you just because you wanted to fit in so that was the first moment about how old were you I was 19 at the time now being 19 mm -hmm. Self-care wasn't really the big thing that it is now. <laughs> no, not at especially all. Especially for men. Mm -hmm. So what made you continue to push forward and bounce and bounce? You were trying new things all the time. Because mm -hmm. you never got in trouble for the same thing twice. No. Right. So, no. so even though being shot mm -hmm. and you had to steal a rod in your leg, you ended up in Oregon? I ended up in Oregon as a sports broadcaster. So when I graduated from Morgan State University, which is... Not the greatest, but one of the greatest HBCUs Thank in the land. You. Thank I just, you. I just wanted the clarification one on that of. part. One of the greatest HBCUs in the land. In 2006, and I had my uh, Bachelor's of Arts in Broadcast Journalism, mm -hmm. and I got a call from a gentleman in Oregon, and he said, man, we have a job for you to be a sports broadcaster. And I was literally on the first thing smoking out to Oregon. And when I got out to Oregon, I think the thing that really, it was another magic moment because okay. at the time I was drinking. I was an alcoholic and at the time, I wasn't at the phase of my life where I could admit that I had a problem. I just thought it was once a week, Rashad is partying. And I was partying, and I'm talking about like hard. When I got off the air on Friday night, <laughs> I was just partying and then, not only that, Anita, I think it was the partying mixed with my ego. Okay. Eventually, I had a DUI, which led another, you know, led to mm -hmm. another scar being on my body, the scar that I have here on my face, and they shipped me back to Baltimore. And it was, Rashad, we love what you do. I'm on the air. The people out here love you, but you have to go back. So that was that another moment in my mm -hmm. life. So I'm still, you know, ping-ponging mm -hmm. and trying to find my way through life. And at that time, if somebody had asked me about self-care, I would have said that self-care is drinking. But in actuality, it wasn't. The self-care was just an unhealthy coping skill that I had developed to kind of fool myself. And then in turn, I was fooling other people. What were you coping for? I was really depressed. Okay. I, I was really depressed. I had a negative self-image about myself. Okay. I never liked the way that I looked and all of these things. And when I literally got off the air, the first thing every night was I need to go get a drink. And because I was in an environment where I was one of the few African-Americans mm -hmm. in this town called Ben, Oregon, they treated me like a celebrity. And that really led to this false sense of 
ego, okay. um, really being boosted up. So I could walk around and, and, you know, at the time I felt like a megastar in this town. Everybody was buying me drinks and sh cigars and Rashad is like the party sports anchor. And it, it just turned out to be a tragic mess at the end, but that was the second like moment in my life and God was like, I'm gonna save you again, <laughs> but I think you need to clean some things up. So that was the second instance in my life, but no, it was no thought of self-care at that time. Now, now you're a counselor. A licensed clinical professional counselor. But when you go into your profession, when you go into the jails, when you talk to juveniles, and they know your history, how do you introduce self-care to them? Wow, one of the things that I always do, and that's a great question, I always share them my story mm -hmm. about not having self-care, and then that's one of the first things right there after I would do is the implementation of self-care. Now, let's be realistic. If I'm talking to a 15 to 19-year-old mm -hmm. young man of color, typically, mm -hmm. self-care is like, mm, Mr. Mills, that's weak, corny. that's, that's mm -hmm. soft, and it's corny. What do you do? And when I tell them some of the things I do, and they can still view me as a masculine dude, okay. then it sort of breaks that the tension or breaks the ice as it relates to self-care. So I'll tell them, and a lot of them will laugh, but I had this routine. I think I developed it in 2017, and don't laugh, but if you do, it's totally fine. One of my self-care things was every Sunday, I would schedule time for me to sit in the bath, listen to some classic, like R&B Anita Baker, and I would drink these drinks. It's called a kombucha. Don't give me that look, Anita. <laughs> like giving you the best that I've got. Like, and hey, I'm just it, in it my zone you, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> relaxing. If it worked for you, bro, it worked. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad. Because you gave me that you. look. Like, come on, Anita <laughs> Baker. But uh, that's really what I would hey, do. Hey, if you did it, I did. You did it. And the interesting thing right. is, is because I'm no longer drinking, I'm four years clean from drinking, I would take a drink called a kombucha, and it's almost like a probiotic, and it's good for your stomach, okay. and I would pour it in a wine glass, and it just gave me this, this peaceful zen, and I would sit in the bathtub with a bath bomb, and I would just relax. Now, when you tell that to your juveniles. They, the, the initial reaction is, Mr. Mills, I love you, man, but are you soft? And I said, nah, man, I got to take care of myself. So self-care to me, it's something that I have to schedule in my routine. And my kids will literally tell you, Sundays, afternoon, after church, I schedule in that epic after church nap. That's a part of my self-care. By 1.30, I don't care what's happening in the world, I need to be lying down. I need to be relaxing and resting. You give me that look again. <laughs> Let's track back through the ping pong life again because yes. we <laughs> Benedict, mm -hmm. one year. One year fell in love, got into some other things, Yeah. found yourself at Morgan, mm -hmm. went to Oregon, then what happened? After Oregon, I came back and it was more soul searching for Rashad. I, I really didn't know who I was and what I wanted to do. My initial goal was to break back in the television industry, but mm -hmm. unfortunately I couldn't do that. So I was in a, I was teaching. And I was teaching, and I, I applied for Teach for America. I okay. thought as an African-American man that wants to teach, I was a shoe-in until I got the rejection letter. And I said, God, where do you want me to go? I thought it was a natural shoe-in you okay. know, for me oh. to teach. And it was a young man, and I think he was in the fourth grade. And I pulled him aside. He had some very problematic behaviors. And I asked him about his behaviors. And this was the magic moment where I knew I had to do something as it relates to counseling. I said, well, why do you do some of the things that you do? Mm -hmm. And he said, my brain tells me to do one thing, but I always do the opposite thing. And that was like the aha, that was the aha moment. I began to apply some to some of the local colleges in terms of being a counselor and Johns Hopkins accepted me. And then that started me on my road to being a uh, licensed counselor. Just that one moment with the fourth grade student. Th this moment, kid was brilliant, absolutely brilliant kid. Did you see any of yourself in that kid? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, and I saw a lot of myself, brilliant kid, and you could see that he was troubled, for lack of a better term, and he could not, you know, reel in his behaviors on a daily basis, but when I can talk to him, when I would talk to him, I, would, I was able to sort of get him to a different place, even if it was for a half an hour, even if it was for transitioning to the next class, I noticed the behaviors change a little bit, and I, that was just the moment for me, and right, even to this day, I don't consider myself a great counselor based on all the things that I learned in grad school. I okay. think counseling is just rapport building and I'm able to build rapport with people. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those sort of ping pong life experiences, mm -hmm. it's now set me up where I can talk to a variety of people, whether you've battled a substance abuse issue, whether your dad hasn't been there. And I'm probably one of the most unbiased counselors you'll ever meet in your life because I understand how life can hit you and life can hit you hard. And you may be in a position that you really don't know how you got there and you're trying to get up out of that hole. So I just think a variety of experiences has really helped me to be the, the counselor that I am today. Has it been smooth sailing for you since you graduated from John Hopkins? Not at all. Mm -hmm. 
Not at all. I mean, life still presents, you know, a variety of challenges. What is the greatest challenge you've ever had to face? Wow. I think, well, it's two of them. Okay. I, I think um, in 2009, June the 2nd, the greatest challenge that I had to face mm -hmm was being the father to two amazing twin girls mm -hmm. because I never grew up with a father present in my life. I didn't know how to be a father. And the good thing about twins, and I, I shared this kind of funny, is that my mindset was if I mess up on one, I still got the other one to get it right. But it was, it was such a challenge. So you're talking about a young man who was still drinking and partying and had no sense of himself, but yet God has given me this amazing responsibility, um, an amazing blessing with two little girls. And I was like, God, well, what do I do now? And that was one of the biggest challenges because they were preemies. And when one came home from the hospital, I think I had tickets to a Baltimore Orioles game. And when the other one came home, I looked at the mom and I said, hey, well, I'm going out to the baseball game. And she looked at me and she said, do you realize that we just have two little girls? Both of them are home from the hospital. And I was like, Rashad, you incredible. I can look back now and say that was one of those moments where I can really look at myself and say how immature I was. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, it was still you know, go out with the boys and party and drink and just, you know, have a blast. So that's the greatest challenge. And then the other one came last year on um, June the 19th. I was incarcerated for three months. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk about mental health on a much greater level. Because you were a counselor mm -hmm. in the penal system, correct? Yes. yes. And this was for phone fraud? It's, no, not phone fraud, okay. telephone misuse. I didn't even know that charge existed until the judge says, well, I'm gonna sentence you to three years and I'll suspend two and a half and give you six months. Then I say, oh, well, I know it exists now. So June the 18th, I was at the Baltimore City Juvenile Justice Center doing you know, what I would typically mm -hmm. do, provide groups, individual sessions to young men. And the next day I went to court for a misdemeanor charge. And as a result of that, I did uh, three months in jail. So you talk about another challenge. So how, because this, this charge puzzles me, because mm -hmm. I've never heard of. I, again, I didn't, know, I didn't know it was real until the judge said bail of cuff him. Then I knew it was real. So what the charge was, it resulted, I was dating a, a young lady at the time, and um, we talk about mental health. I do this every day. I can help other people, but at that moment, I lost it. And I really wanted to, for lack of a better term, voice myself, right? Um, and I kept calling her until I thought I could get my message across. Some very troubling things happened in our relationship. As a result of that, that's why I did three months in the jail. Uh, do you think that was fair? Uh, in, in terms of fair, I don't, I don't think it was fair, but I'll say this. I think it was Rashad had to be accountable for his actions. Mm -hmm. And I think for me and where I'm going in my life, I think it was one of the greatest things. It will turn out to be the greatest 101 days of my life. So looking back at it in hindsight, mm -hmm. because this time last year, I was actually locked up. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest three months of my life because what it did is it shaped Rashad in a whole new way. And when I'm talking about from, I knew it was some things that God had to clean up in me, incredibly arrogant. And when I was in the jail, I was literally telling some of the CEOs, do you know who I am? I have my own radio show. I'm a therapist. I'm a speaker. And they were looking at me like, yeah, you inmate 458627. And it, it humbled me so much that now I'm at a place, um, about a month ago, I was, I was making myself some breakfast every day at the same meal, turkey, bacon, egg, and cheese, and oatmeal, right? And after a while, it's like dry and bland because I eat it every day. And I was saying, man, this, this, this just sucks for lack of a better term. And then instantly... God was like, man, you remember when you were in an environment where you had to eat what you were told. So this sense of humility every day is a blessing to me. Every day, I always say to myself, I'm in overtime. I'm in overtime. Every day that God allows me to wake up, I'm in overtime because this is the bonus round of me because I know what it's like to be in an environment where you have to ask people to do certain things. Mm -hmm. You have to ask. You have to literally fill out a form to get a haircut. You have to literally fill out a form. I lost my bed sheet. And this, uh, this part of it is in my book. I lost a sheet that you would need to sleep on every night. You know what they told me? Fill out a 118. So you know what I had to do? I had to literally take towels and wash them every night. And then that became my sheet because I had to wait a week. If you lost your toothbrush or a cup, mm -hmm. you need to fill out a 118. So this sense of humility, um, wow. Sense of humility in my relationship with God strengthened like you, you wouldn't believe it. So it's, and now to myself, I'll always say, if I go into a jail and prison and speak and do mental health services, I can do it with a different perspective. Like I know what it's like. Like now, I, at one point I was actually jaded because I wanted to go and just be the greatest motivational speaker ever. And I think God said, let me, 
let me bring you back down. So now when I go in jails and prisons and things of that nature, the conversations are different because I know that person may need to just talk to me for 10 to 15 minutes. It can change the course of that day, that week, potentially the course of their life mm -hmm. because you're in an environment. And, uh, you know, pardon my French, I'm bilingual, but it's hell. Jail is hell. Here's what you miss when you're not in studio with That Anita Live. Oh. I don't even mention this in the book. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Blame. I ain't. At 96th Street, you transfer into the one. You want it. Blame. I Because you know, I'm at the end of my toilet paper roll when you talk about seasons in life. She said, mm. I'd rather be good by myself. <laughs> Please, spill the tea. Come on. I love to have you in my audience. Please, Please tell them. Girl, you Please tell the man to leave it. Let's hop into, as a mental health professional, mm -hmm. what do you suggest for men for self-care? Like what are some of the top three things that men can do to practice self-care? Schedule rest. I think we're in a society right now that most of the successful people that we watch and typically it's via social media mm -hmm. or the internet is grind, it's grind, I gotta hustle, no sleep. I think that's one of the, the biggest things that are contributing to mainly brothers right now, brothers and sisters, but since we're talking about men, brothers passing out and dying. Mm -hmm. Because we have this mentality that I have to hustle, I have to go get it, I have to grind. I'm a provider, priest, protector, which in fact we are, but I think in those roles, mm -hmm. we have to understand that if I'm not the greatest version of myself, then nobody else can get the greatest version of me. And prior to even going to jail, I was at that point. I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. Interestingly enough, some of the most peaceful days of my life happened while I was incarcerated. I never thought I would say that ever, because guess what? It was, I didn't have to worry about being a father. I didn't have to worry about paying bills. I didn't have to worry about the next speaking engagement. Mm -hmm. So men, we, we're almost challenged with all of these tests that we have to go, 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 do, do, do. But at the end of the day, health and mainly sleep is, is the biggest thing because we have people that are, sleeping four or five hours a day. And these are the people that are driving buses. These are the people that are protecting us, police officers. We have doctors, you know, performing surgeries and they're not sleeping because society says we have to do, do, do. And, you know, after that experience, I think sleep is, is crucial. Okay, so that's the man. Now, for the woman mm -hmm. that's in that man's life, how can she convey that to him to help him understand that he does need rest? Communicate, communicate in a, in a healthy way. And when I say communicate in a healthy way, oftentimes the communication process, we know it's a sender and a receiver of that message. Mm -hmm. And I think this is for the lady in that, the, the gentleman's life, she has to find, know his communication style, whatever his language is in order for him to receive the okay. message. It doesn't mean when he first walks in the door, you need to get some sleep. <laughs> that's probably not gonna be the best, that's probably not gonna be the best <laughs> method, right? So you have to be in tune and have that level of discernment in terms of what's his communication style and whatever that is, you need to communicate with him. Hey, I've been watching you, you're not at, you know, at your best. Are you sleeping at night? Like what's your sleep schedule like? And I think it's just uh, women have a huge role to play in a man's life and, and vice versa because men, most men, we're actually going out and grinding why, to be that provider or to make the woman and the family that we have at home happy so mm -hmm. they have sort of insider information in order to help this this gentleman out in terms of taking care of yourself first number two wow other than, number two i think it's just knowing yourself is important to self-care like knowing yourself because again for rashad it may be you know a, a bubble bath and relaxing listening to music yeah, go into that bath again. man it, it's relaxing <laughs> I'm telling you, immediately after the show, go home and try it. I'm telling you, it's, it's incredibly relaxing, but you have to know yourself and what works for you. For some men, that may not work. For some brothers, it's the physical part of self-care, like which is going to the, you know, the gym and, and lifting as much as they can. Okay. That may work for them. For me, I like long distance jogging. Long distance jogging gives me a great opportunity just to listen to music and just be in tune with my thoughts. Um, so I think it's a physical component, but I think the second thing is really knowing yourself and then knowing who you are and what works for you, it will lead to those other things because everything that somebody else does won't work for Rashad and then vice versa. Okay, self-awareness is very important. Oh, it's critical. You have to know, you have to know who you are. Like part of self-care, like the emotional part, mm -hmm. knowing who you are, like you really have to challenge yourself internally. And when I say challenge yourself internally, 
and don't laugh, and I, you probably would laugh at this one, but I have conversations with myself all the time because I'm so aware of Rashad. I know, and we use this word in mental health, I know what triggers Rashad and what doesn't. So I'm having conversations with myself all the time about being aware and just really in tune, going back to you know, awareness, being mm -hmm. in tune with myself is like really important. Number three. Number three, it's, I think it has to be a, something that you have to do for your mind specifically. Like for me, I read a lot. I, th I think that's good for my mind. Some, um, I, some brothers are really into um, games. They play games on their phone, which would like help them, uh, help them from a mental perspective, challenge their mind a little bit. You have some brothers at crossword puzzles. I mean, old school things, whether it's sitting down reading a paper, right, which is not even heard of in, in 2019 because everything is on the phone. But I think it has to be a mental component of it where you literally challenging your brain and when I say challenging your brain not to the point that it's not self-care mm -hmm. but challenging your brain to the point that you're keeping your brain active so that's be my third one what are some of the activities that men can do to keep their brain active because the average male mm -hmm. that's not at the top of their list on what they should be doing they don't even understand why self-care is important I think so most what, men, they mm -hmm. think self-care is something that a woman should do. I, I love the fact um, of audio books. So like hearing things, mm -hmm. um, I think audio books are great. And even, even listening to music, it may not sound like that self-care, but in fact it is because typically if I'm driving and I'm listening to music, it allows my mind to just wander and it allows that healthy time. You need, part of self-care is that you need to have your mind be in a place where you can have your mind wander. Okay. Even though the time is intentional, sometimes I think it's great for your mind to allow your mind just to simply wander. And I'm talking about wandering where it's not glued to a TV show, mm -hmm. where it's not glued to something that you have to concentrate on. And I think having your mind just wander is incredibly healthy. That's why I love long distance jogging. When I'm out jogging, my mind is wandering. By the time that I'm finished, I'm not even listening to the song that I had originally, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. started listening to. So just allowing your time for your mind to wander is good. But so, men are, are audio book kind of people. So what's the difference to say the man will know whether or not it's working? When I started, these were my activities. Mm -hmm. These were my thoughts. Um, I was unable to control the chatter in my mind or I was unable to stop that go, go, go feeling. What should they look for on the other side of an activity to say this one works for me versus that one does not? Great. Do you feel better? Do you feel better when that activity has concluded? Do I feel better after a long jog? When I went out, I had a lot of tension and stress. But when I get home from that long jog, do I feel better? Do I feel relieved? If the answer is yes, then that's a self-care activity that you can engage in and schedule time to engage in it. If I go to the gym and I come home and I still have these thoughts on my mind, the quietness of my mind couldn't happen at the gym, maybe it's not the gym for you. So you have to determine, again, going back to self-awareness, when the conclusion of that activity has occurred, mm -hmm. do in fact I feel better? And that's one, one of those things that you have to really know yourself to say, do I feel better after it's over? And if I did, then I want to engage in it and I want to schedule it more, okay. engage in it as much as possible. How did you find yours? Um, I, think a lot, I think a lot of mine was I stumbled across it, like the long distance jog. And I would go out at night and I had no idea. I just wanted to exercise. And I think at night for me was like very peaceful. There's mm -hmm. nobody on the streets, mm -hmm. you know, at, at all. And it was very peaceful. And then as I got deep into the field of mental health, I realized this isn't just a random activity that I like. This is something that I need to do more often. And I need to intentionally have this a part of my self-care. So at the beginning of every year, I'll find a half a marathon, 13.1 miles, and I'll schedule it. And I know training up until that point, number one, it keeps me disciplined. It keeps me disciplined about the way that I eat. Um, I have something to look forward to every day, so I have that visual. And then I know I'm gonna get naturally better every day I go out and jog. Not even necessarily from the jogging, but from the mental health part of it. So I schedule um, a half a marathon every year. It's, it's part of, literally part of my self-care. The same one every year or you just find? Different ones. So this week, uh, this year I just completed the, the Maryland Half Marathon, I think June the 8th out in Columbia. Yeah. Maybe we can train for one. Never. <laughs> Never? Okay. You don't have to worry about <laughs> need to run in anywhere. That's not going to A part happen. of your self-care. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Knowing I'm not a jogger. <laughs> self-care for men. Why is it different from self-care for women? 
I think it's different only in the sense of that it's harder to get a guy engaged in self-care. And why is that? Because I think society still says is this, you know, masculinity, these quote unquote unofficial rules okay. that we have to go by. Mm -hmm. No, we don't need the self-care, man. You just drink it away. Or you just go out and you just hang with the boys or whatever that, you know, I'm, and I'm talking things I think that are so outdated. Mm -hmm. And as a society, I think we're gradually getting better in that regard. But I think it's so much harder for a man to, number one, schedule it. Because a lot of my clients say, are you scheduling time for yourself? And other than the gym, it's nothing scheduled because it's still this sort of stigma attached to self-care and being masculine. They just don't mix in a lot of people's worlds. So I think number one is scheduling. Scheduling, I think other than that. How do you talk men out of that? That the stigma doesn't apply? Um, I always share a lot of my experiences, but I have them in a session do a personal analysis of themselves. And when I, when I say a personal analysis, when they say, mm -hmm. well, this mm -hmm. is troubling me. And then we kind of look at what you're doing to, um, I guess, get over these personal challenges that you're having. And I never hear self-care. And then I always say, well, maybe you can try this. And the reaction is always the same, man, I'm not doing that. I'm not scheduling time, no. But then I'll, again, I'll go back to, have the things that you've been doing previously, are they working for you? And the reaction, I mean, the, the response is always no. And then if it's not working, then we need to change something. And I think about, you know, maybe three or four sessions are really at the right time, not literally hitting them over their head when they walk in a session talking about it, but at the right moments, inserting that into their brain, mm -hmm. you can gradually see growth. I think men, as opposed to women, we are naturally um, less resistant to change. Okay. So it takes us a longer time, especially as it relates to, again, ourselves, because many of the models of true men that we've witnessed, mm -hmm. they weren't going to the doctors. Have you, have you noticed any trends within the mental health field in Maryland? I have. Adding self-care for men? Absolutely. How so? Because I think uh, one of the things is social media. This is one of the benefits of social media. You see it more and more often that men are actually talking about the importance of self-care. You have a lot of religious organizations that are incorporating it into their their normal practices. Okay. You, you see it more on mainstream media. You see celebrities talking about it more. You even see it, um, which is the, the biggest uh, selling point for men, we talk talking football season is going to be coming up. Mm -hmm. So we see it amongst athletes talking about taking care of yourself and mental health. So men need to really see another tribe of men okay. that they consider manly to do it before they'll kind of inch their way into it before they're all in. Okay. Any parting words for men that feel as if they do not need to practice self-care? Absolutely. I think self-care, every man that has the opportunity to watch this show, I want them to understand that self-care is Self-care is critical for your growth. You cannot be the best person that you are to anyone involved in your immediate circle if, in fact, you're not taking care of yourself. All of the mistakes I think that I made in life, not even I think, I know for sure, when I look back, a result of those were Rashad didn't take care of himself properly, and then in turn, I'm not making proper decisions because... I'm not at 100%. So be the best version of yourself that you can be to yourself, and in turn, the world will receive that 100% as well. Point taken. I'm Anita, your host. Be sure to check out that anitalive.com for where and when to see our next episode.